Hello and welcome to another Back to Jerusalem podcast. I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, and I'm coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of America this time. And I've got a good friend back on, Pastor Joshua Jones. He's been on with us in the past. If you go way back in our archives, you'll be able to find him. Um, I haven't actually communicated with him for a while, and the reason why is because I was booted off of Facebook for like two or three years. So I'm back on Facebook. I actually don't use that account very much, but when I did... I was really interested in hearing what Pastor Jones was saying um, about a subject that I think that you will find very interesting about the biblical perspective on UFOs and aliens. Pastor Joshua, you there, bro? Yeah, I'm right here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you back on. Yeah, well, fantastic, uh, Eugene. Love loved your podcast and the uh, the ministry you guys are a part of, and uh, always a joy just to have conversations with you. I think we've uh, talked about all sorts of wild things over the years. We have, and I've had a really good time. I love kind of your unique perspective and your biblical foundation on explaining different topics and subjects, and uh, and your sense of humor fits right in. I think with our B to J audience. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of sense of humor, there was um, a guy in our congregation. So uh, I think maybe since last time I was on your um, uh, here here on your podcast, I uh, moved from London uh, out here to the Midwest of the United States, uh, where where I currently pastor. And a guy in the congregation recently bought the um, the book on on meat that uh, oh, uh, I nice. had written a few years ago. Nice. And, uh, your 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 introduction, because if you remember Eugene, you you wrote the foreword for that. Um, he he wasn't sure whether it was a joke when you said <laughs> the book was blasphemous or not. And he goes, "Does this guy just kind of have an off sense of humor?" And I said, "Yes, definitely. He, he has all sorts of issues." So, uh. it, well, uh, just for our audience that you know people might be hearing you for the very first time, can you give us just a brief background of uh, who you are and uh, and and what brings sure. you on the podcast? Sure. Well, I, I was raised on the East Coast uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Shortly after high school, I met a, uh, a young woman from uh, Denmark, from the Faroe Islands, actually. Um, she, she's living in, in Copenhagen and then moving, uh, actually, then moved to Iceland. So she was Scandinavian, Nordic. And we met and about a year after we met, we got married. So really early on in my adult life, by the age of 20, I was living in Europe, uh, married and lived my whole adult life uh, there until about two years ago. Um, that was about five years in France, a little bit in Iceland, but most of the time was in the United Kingdom. Uh, down there uh, around London was where I pastored previous to, to now. And uh, now I'm uh, pastoring, now I'm back in the United States. Um, my it, That's kind of new for my wife and new for our four kids who, uh, you know, are American citizens because of me, but were born and raised um, primarily in the United Kingdom. Where at in the Midwest? Uh, in Nebraska. Nebraska. So wow, hour, big change. Yeah, yeah. So I'm about half an hour west of Lincoln um, in a smaller community of about 3,000, very rural, very um, blue-collar, a lot of farmers uh, in our church, and has a strong sort of Mennonite uh history about the place. A lot of Mennonite churches in, in the area. So um, going from a very secular progressive city like London to a socially uh, conservative, uh, small rural blue collar town is, you know, a big cultural shift. Yeah, it must be. But it might be a little, I mean, there, I'm assuming there's some familiarity with like um, uh, the Faroe Islands, you know, which I think have more mm -hmm. sheep than people. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and, right. uh, I don't, I'm assuming the only habitable place in Iceland that I can think of is Reykjavik. So I don't know yeah. where you, where she lived in Iceland, but I'm assuming Reykjavik. Yeah. So I, I don't know, but I think Lincoln might have as many people as Reykjavik. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that's <laughs> a very, uh, astute, um, <laughs> comparison. They are pretty similar in size about, uh, Maybe around two hundred fifty thousand. Okay, uh, right. I'd say right. Um, and in like Iceland, you know, uh, in I in Iceland, the population is only between three and four hundred thousand people in the whole nation. So two thirds of the uh, population lives there in the capital, and everyone else is kind of spread out all throughout Iceland. Very similarly, um, the vast majority of the population of Nebraska lives in Lincoln and Omaha, which are two cities in the southeast corner really right next to each other, only about 45 minutes apart. 
and and the vast majority of the population lives in one of those two cities, uh, and then everything else is uh, just spread out. So, you know, these little towns here and there that are either comprised of farmers or ranchers, and um, you know, towns all, you know, at, at the most a couple of tens of thousands. But uh, I know it's not a destination for a lot of people, but I'm you know I'm just a big fan. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of like the Northwest. So I mean, Montana. Yeah. Uh, even though, you know, Nebraska is considered Midwest, in many ways, it's kind of right there on that border area. So you get a feel of both yeah. Midwest and Northwest, kind of both yeah, in, so in one. growing up on the East Coast, um, I, I didn't know much about the Midwest, you know, as most people on the coasts do. You know, this is flyover country uh, for us, and we're pretty ignorant. So coming to ne- Nebraska and in, that, in the last two years exploring the territory here in the midwest it, it's really been interesting this is uh, being in the east of nebraska i'm in central time and uh, i'm considered part of you know the the midwest but if i go to the western side of the state i'm now in mountain time and all of a sudden it's a whole lot drier the humidity is way way down you know and then you're in really the west you know you're, you're in a climate more similar to uh, colorado and utah and arizona um, and the same for South Dakota. You can almost draw a line right through the middle of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Oklahoma. And uh, there's a big both climate and cultural shift, it seems, between the eastern part of the state and the western part of the state where you go from farmer to cowboy. Yeah, no, and I, I, I kind of love both of those cultures, the farmer and the and the cowboy side, that freedom that um, and, and mm-hmm. I mean, you also get that good, wholesome kind of feel which I kind of yeah. think in some ways goes back. I mean, this is a different subject, completely different than what we're going to be talking about. But yeah. um, right. when I see the very first command of God to send the people out to all, to, to multiply and, and subdue the earth, um, the, the very thing, because there's always these times where I've looked at, you know, the building of the Tower of Babel, and I'm like, what, what exactly did they do wrong? Um, and it's like, well, they built this tower to themselves. But if you read it, it says, let us build a tower unto ourselves, lest we be scattered. And yeah. so it was a call to to uh, to almost domesticate, to bring everybody into these these um, like the very first metropolitan. And whenever I look at like the the most shifty areas of the world where where sin is the most open, it's the most accepted. We see the most de- uh, decrepit culture, um, people you know being uh, lying and cheating and stealing uh, as a as a normal part of life. It's usually in the metropolitan areas. The the yeah. Londons, the New Yorks, the the um, the big cities, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's you kind more of, sin there because there's more people there. Yeah, yeah, um, but I kind of feel like there's also an acceptance that you don't yeah. really get um, in yeah. a place like Nebraska, and so I I I don't know. Yeah. I I gravitate. I, mean, I gravitate is, towards and I, and I mean this in primarily a good way. I mean, it, there's you know being used to the city. You, you, there are a couple of things I miss about the city. <laughs> I uh, bet, and I, I bet. do like to get into Lincoln and Omaha and every now and then. Um, but, but generally I, I do like it out here. Um, and, but, but it is a little bit stepping back in time yes. for someone uh, yeah. in Western Europe or on maybe one of, you know, like the, the East or the West coast. I mean, you know, it's cowboy boots and cool whip and really honest to God <laughs> casseroles, are, are still the thing, you know, uh, but, but it's, it's charming and, uh, I'm finding myself really enjoying it actually. Oh, good. I'm so happy about that. Well, the reason why I, you know, I was really interested in bringing you on is you did um, a YouTube video uh, that I yeah. found fascinating about uh, UFOs and aliens, and um, you were talking about like how can Christians engage people that might be curious about the Christian perspective on UFOs yeah. and aliens, and it seems like we have, uh, at least in my childhood. In my mm-hmm. childhood, you know, it was it was a tin hat thing. Nobody really yeah. took it serious. It was a joke. But now we're talking about congressional hearings. And my background is in the military. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. oldest son is in, in the Marine Corps. My youngest son is in the uh, Air Force. Um, you have both of those branches, re, uh, you know, making official reports about um, unidentified objects that they've seen that are just nothing like what's in the uh, in 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 the 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 military. Anything that they've yeah. ever seen before, um, things yeah. that defy the rules of of logic and physics. Yeah. 
And so um, I think that the subject has be, has come a little bit more to the forefront. And it's a good question. Where do Christians stand? What does the Bible say? What do Christians believe? And I thought that you gave a, 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 a pretty good, an, uh, I guess, not so much of an answer, but more of a start of discussion. Can you can you go ahead and take it from here? Tell me what is your feeling about UFOs, aliens, and yeah. and the Christian perspective. Yeah, well, I'm I'm not an ufologist, which uh, I've only learned in the last year is the uh, uh, proper term for someone who really is into the lore and study of UFOs. I learned that from you. I've never yeah. heard that before. So that, that, but that it's a new first. term for me. Too. I just really, you know, like you've just said, in the last year, a lot of these uh, fringe conversations have become more mainstream, uh, where, you know, Congress is holding hearings on it, where Joe Rogan is having episodes on it, where at my own Thanksgiving table, you know, uh, hearing a couple of my male relatives talking about it at uh, Thanksgiving uh, this year. And so as this becomes more of a normal conversation, my thought as a pastor is right. How can a Christian engage intelligently in these discussions? Do I mean, do we just look at them and say, hey, you folks are crazy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or do we just say, well, the, the, I think it's it doesn't exist, or maybe some might say, I think it's demons. Um, and so this is just what I shared in my video that's uh, out there is, is just sort of uh, an introduction of, you know, you ufology and uh, biblical theology for dummies, just sort of where they overlap. It, it's nothing particularly in-depth, but um, the starter goes sort of like this. Uh, the A lot of the articles and the accounts uh, that we're hearing through the news, through the media, uh, they, they have certain similarities. It's not just that people saw uh, a UFO, which uh, I have people in my church who claim they, they, they swear they have seen uh, a UFO. Um, and but according to one NBC poll, up to six percent. Yeah, that's right. Not zero point six, but six percent of Americans claim they have been abducted by aliens. Now, that's an NBC poll. NBC poll so, you know, take that with a, uh, a grain of salt for uh, for whatever. Um, but uh, the, the fact that even if that's just one percent, that's a huge number of people out there who claim to be have uh, been abducted by a UFO. Now, that a lot of that may be drug related or just a, a weird uh, drug trip. But the fast the thing I find fascinating is what they say these encounters were like and some of the things being said in increasingly more the, the mainstream uh, media. And the people who claim to be abducted is that there's a couple of commonalities, one of which is uh, tech, about technology. Um, and this goes to show you how not fringe this is. Uh, there's a professor over at Oxford back in uh, the United Kingdom, a professor at Oxford University, one of the great you know, higher educational institutions of Europe and the world, really, in the, you know, one of the top 10 uh, universities. And there's a professor there who's a believer in, uh, you know, ufology and, and UFOs and aliens. And uh, she is convinced that, you know, the aliens are contacting us to give us technology in order to survive climate change. They, you know, her, her narrative is kind of, well, they, the, the aliens looking at us and uh, are obvious, you know, they, they see how obvious it is that we are stupid and, you know, we've really messed up the climate and we're destroying ourselves. So uh, out of uh, charitable intentions of their heart, they're going to come and meet with us and try to give us the technology we need to kind of survive the coming climate uh, apocalypse. Yeah, that's kind of uh, at least what she is saying. But there are others talking about technology of different sorts. And even in the military hearings, there, there's been this uh, question of, well, this military technology, is it from America? Is it from China? The, you know, who is it from? Or is it from outer space? Because it's a technology we know nothing about. We, if, it, if it is aliens, we need to learn what this technology is. You know, it, So that, that's one common theme you're hearing over and over. And another thing uh, that from people who've been abducted, from the abductees, is there's often – some sort of sexual element to it um you know they're they're interested in uh the man's sperm or in impregnating the women uh you know th these are some of the testimonies again i'm not trying to convince anyone of these testimonies i'm really not sure what i think of these stories my myself um you know i, I want to know <laughs> how many of these are, are drug addicts giving these testimonies versus uh, otherwise normal stable people but but the similarity of you know having a sexual element it, is certainly there and so that's ufology, but where this overlaps with sort of historic, ancient Jewish Christian thought 
is uh, in the story of Noah, and uh, particularly the story of Noah um, that is more, more expounded upon in the book of Enoch. Now, I, I don't know if a lot of your listeners are, are familiar with the book of Enoch. It uh, was the, the, the current one in its existing form uh, is in five sections. But historically, the, the, it was only the two first the, the first two parts that are really ancient and were uh, used by the Jews uh, before Christ. And re- after Christ, uh, you know, a couple, it, it expounded and, and grew and there was some additions, later additions to the book of Enoch, but it's a very old book. Um, and the early church uh, took it seriously, not that they thought it should be canon, but they took it seriously as a history book and would often quote it. In fact, in Ethiopia, yeah, this is part of their Bible. So if you go to the Ethiopian church, yeah, you, probably most of your listeners, if they are uh, Protestant, will be aware that Catholics tend to have you know some extra books that, that we as Protestants don't, while the Ethiopian Coptic church has uh, not only those extra books, but they also have the Book of Enoch included as part of the canon. Now, I don't think the, the Book of Enoch um, it should be canonical, but it is obvious that not only the early church, but also the writers of the New Testament took it seriously. For example, where Jesus said, Says, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, that's uh, straight out of the old section of um, the Book of Enoch. Um, also, we have Jude in his uh, short one chapter epistle, you know, where he actually quotes from Enoch. You know, he says, as Enoch prophesied that you know the Lord will come with ten thousand of his saints. Uh, that he's just quoting from the very first chapter there. In, um, in 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 the book of Enoch. So, uh, you know, and Peter, I guess Second Peter chapter 2, where he refers to, you know, those angels who did not, you know, maintain their stations, but uh, uh, came down and were judged and are kept in chains of darkness. Uh, all that is, is, is straight, too, from the book of Enoch. So it, it, even though it's not in the New Testament or part of the Bible, it is quoted and, and referred to. Where this overcomes, you know, how this deals with um, ufology is... Uh, you, we many of your listeners will probably be aware of Genesis chapter six, the story of Noah, and the whole thing about the Nephilim, which is kind of debated, and people wonder what are these Nephilim. And it says the sons of God found the daughters of men attractive and came down to him, and the, that the the babies born were the Nephilim, the, these great giants sort of uh, creatures. And nowadays there's some debate what that might refer to. There's this argument about the line of Seth. Uh, maybe it's, you know, the sons of God are the line of Seth and the daughters of men. Maybe they're the line of Cain. But that's a pretty modern twist to it. Uh, historically, certainly throughout the early church, as well as in Jewish liter- literature um, predating Christ, uh, the the belief was that these were what is referred to as the watchers. Uh, now, the watchers, that's kind of a, a term for s- sort of either an angelic race or a uh, an elder race, some sort of spiritual or uh, other non-human creatures that existed before the creation of man. Uh, Daniel refers to these watchers, and I saw a watcher. You know that that term is used there, and it's used a lot more later in uh, other uh, extra biblical Jewish literature. Um, and th- that the the story is that Enoch would tell it was that there were these watchers, these certain either elder race, if you want to call it that, or angelic sort of creatures that were given to to governing and overlooking and sort of protecting the earth, but either because of uh, Satan's influence or their own corruption of their own heart, uh, they began to become unsatisfied with this. And they wanted a piece of the action on earth. Um, and so they came down and mated with, um, w- with human women. That was, that's part of the story, and you get a, a hint of that there in Genesis chapter 6. The book of Enoch takes that and it expounds upon it and just adds a lot more to it. And according to the book of Enoch, the deal was this. Hey, listen, you know, the, these watchers come down in sort of a glorified human form uh, as these, these great glorious creatures and strike up a deal with the fathers of uh, humanity and say, you let us marry your daughters and we will give you our technology. Okay. We will give you the secrets of metal and the secrets of, uh, magic and the secrets of, uh, how to do this and that with bronze and iron, and you'll be able to communicate and all, all these fascinating things that in the book of Enoch expounds upon, uh, this, that, well, one, the fathers were happy to marry off their daughters and the daughters didn't seem to complain because these creatures were more marvelous and more mighty and more strong and more glorious than your average, you know, (laughs) Joe Bob down the road. 
Um, so, you know, they, they sort of became almost queens on the earth by virtue of marrying um, these these watchers. So it seemed like a good deal for everybody. The yeah. fathers were marrying off their their daughters to uh, what looked like universal royalty. Uh, the daughters were happy because, uh, you know, they they were getting these glorious uh, bridegrooms. And humanity was happy because they were getting um, all this new technology. And um, so th- that's kind of Enoch. Uh, that's how Enoch, um, you know, uh, tells the story in the first two sections uh, of his book ab- about Noah. And but this creates war. It's 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 a trap. It's it's a great betrayal because the, the children born are the these Nephilim, these giants. But instead of just being great human leaders. They, they begin to consume humanity. The Nephilim want to take over, and that leads the world into a time of great violence and civil war uh, where they're using this uh, great technology that they've gotten from the Watchers, and they, they instead of tools, it becomes weapons. Um, and so uh, this is, the, uh, this is the, the scene we have going up into the flood, uh, according to the book of um, – according to the book of Enoch. Now, this, this might – Give us a hint, and I say this, uh, I hold this loosely, I'm not being over dogmatic with this point, but this might give us a little insight into, you know, Jesus in the New Testament and, you know, Matt, his discourse on the end times there, Matthew 24, and then uh, again in, in Luke 17, where he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be before the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so our, our question is, well, how how was it, <laughs> you know, how was it in the days of Noah? Um uh, you know, but so that we can know uh, what is it like before the coming of the days of Son of Man. You know, he said it, it will be the same because people will be marrying and giving in marriage. Mm. Now, in one way, you know, if you just look at that, I remember I used to kind of scratch my head and it's like, well, people have always been marrying and giving in marriage. Like what? What in the world? What sort of uh, answer is that as it was in the days of Noah? Oh, people were giving in marriage and, you know, it, and I was like, that, that's just strange because that describes all of human history. But if his initial listeners were steeped in the book of Enoch, which they, they clearly were, uh, and every first century Jew would have been, um, when they hear, as it was in the days of Noah, giving in marriage and taking in marriage, for them it would have had some different connotations uh, to modern listeners. Uh, their imagination was shaped by the book of Enoch in, in ways that most Christians today just – just aren't. Um, and so the, the thing that was unique about the, in, in the time of Noah, right before the flood, there was a very unique type of marrying and giving in marriage that only happened at that time. And Jesus says, uh, before my coming, it will be uh, become this way again. Um, and so that's just uh, an idea. I'm not that's is isn't something I go around uh, preaching or anything like that. But I, I do think this this is this should be consideration that when people are coming to us claiming to have these experiences, I was taken up in a UFO and this creature, this uh, said, if I give them my sperm, they'll give me some secrets to technology. That that should at least make us curious to think, huh, something in our past is Jewish Christian past. Uh, you know, this sounds just a little bit familiar. Yeah, and I, so I, for let, me, let's I have mean, a discussion about this. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that you said was very interesting back, if we go back just a little bit, is that. Six? Did you say six percent of Americans say they've been abducted by aliens? I say an NBC poll said that. Oh, okay, yeah, an NBC poll. So an NBC poll says six percent. That's that's almost twenty million people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That say that they've been abducted. So I, I mean, on one side I laugh, but on the other side, um, the Bible is full of tons of mysteries, which is why I found it fascinating that you you're on here, because I think oftentimes when we in, when we embrace Christianity as a cultural thing in, in, instead of a uh, instead of a spiritual thing, one of the things that I think that we quickly do is we we normalize everything in the Bible. We try to make it as palpable as possible in modern day society, and and there leaves very little room for you know the miraculous, of course, and and those kind of things. But um, also, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we just don't square with. I think when it comes to our modern way of thinking, like it's very difficult for us to 
to, uh, I mean, right now there's a, there's a lot of first people groups kind of movements. Um, we, we see a lot of, uh, you know, the, the land belongs to the indigenous people. Um, and, yeah. the, but if we look at the, uh, the calling for the Jewish people, when God calls them to be his called chosen people, um, he basically said, you see that land over there? Yeah, I'm giving it to you. I know there's occupants. You're going to kick them out. And you're going to take over. Uh, that is completely against like our modern day thinking. Um, when yeah. we start seeing like some of the uh, genocide that takes place, when we see bears coming out and killing, you know, whether you can argue what children really means, but it's it's there. We see yeah. uh, John chapter six verse sixty six, one of the darkest verses in the Bible, in my opinion, when Jesus is telling his disciples, which are more than twelve at that time, yeah. um, he's telling them, "Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood." People are like whoa, whoa, that sounds a little crazy. Um, and they all leave him, and it's only the 12 left. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that what you are talking about when we start talking about um, the the um, uh, Nephilim, uh, when we yeah. start talking about uh, angels uh, mating with women or demons yeah. mating with women, when we talk about heaven and hell, um, those things are not easy to even talk about in today's society because they sound yeah. so... Um, mysterious and mythical and, and unreal. And so I think that uh, this is something that is absolutely fascinating. It's a part of our Bible that we don't really embrace. And I think it's really powerful. And it's interesting that I didn't notice it until you started talking about um, this whole dynamic uh, as it relates to the end of time as it relates to the end of time, at least during the days of Noah, the first kind yeah. of destruction of the world, we see these activities taking place. And is there a way that we can kind of compare to what we see today in the second destruction or the return of Christ himself? And um, I've actually been looking specifically at Genesis chapter six. I mean, for me, I don't look at these kind of things for the return of Christ. I, our big thing at Back to Jerusalem is just preach the gospel to yeah. all the nations, and then the end yeah. will come. That is Amen. our mandate, and so that's yes. what we focus on. Um, however, there is you know signs of times that are that we should not ignore. And, uh, and I'm not saying that this is a direct relation, but it does come yeah. from Genesis chapter six, where I did not know before until... October of last year, that the word Hamas, even though it's a different word yeah. as it's as it's related to the group Hamas, it's mm -hmm. still the same pronunciation. It, Hamas is in Genesis chapter six, yeah. and it says hum, that God That's destroyed right. earth because of Hamas, which is directly yeah. translated as the violence of men. Yeah, uh, and so I I I do think that there's something that, about that word is also used in conjunction to to Egypt. And God's destruction of the, them as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, these. I think these things really do point for us as Christians to yeah. uh, to things that are are great to discuss, to ponder mm -hmm. upon, um, and to do yeah. it in in relation with one another. I think that we we get crazy when we try to read the Bible by ourselves and not with others, where God enlightens others around us to feed in, where we sharpen each other. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I love bringing you on. You, you, you bring up this idea of, uh, ufology. I think you said uh, you yeah. bring up the idea of ufology. You bring up the, the, what the Bible says. Um, and you also poke a little bit of curiosity in the book of Enoch. I think I'm going to go and read the book of Enoch now. Um, mm -hmm. not like you, I don't necessarily believe that it should be canonized, but it mm -hmm. is, if it, if it's something that is quoted, um, in the Bible, then it would be at least worthy of, of being familiar, whether it's in yeah. its complete form or whether it has been polluted mm -hmm. in some way yeah. is another debate, but I would, I would still yeah. like to see even the polluted version. What is there? Yeah. I mean, the first two sections were considered historically reliable, um, seemingly, but, you know, just the, in how it is quoted and it seems to be viewed, at least, you know, of course, by the, the New Testament writers, but also by the, the early church fathers. I, again, that's the first two sections. The other three sections came later and, you know, there might be different ideas uh, uh, about, about that. Yeah, well, I mean, when it when it comes to like the 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 angels mating with women, yeah. we see that with the Hebrew Bible, yeah. we see that with the Christian Bible, we even see that with the Quran. Um, yeah. 
So yeah. we, we've, we've got kind of, um, at, you know, when, whenever I do land navigation, I do a thing called dead reckoning, uh, back yeah. when I was in the military where, you know, you can't, you have no identifiable, identifiable objects to go off of. So mm -hmm. what you have to do is use a thing called dead reckoning where you, you know where your compass points and you just count your pace step, your pacing as you go. And as you see reference points on the ground, you try to reference those on your map. Now it might be that you're looking at the wrong reference point in real life or a wrong reference point on your map and might mistaken mistaken where you're at. But yeah. if you can find more than one reference point, it yeah. zeroes you in more identifiable to where you actually are. And we have yeah. the same with GPSs. When we're driving around with GPSs, the more satellites that you can bounce off of, the more yeah. accurate your position and your reading. And so yeah. I, I, I love, you know, looking at the Bible and the different references um, in order to cross-reference to see where I'm yeah. at, where yeah. I should be, what the Bible is saying. So, yeah, yeah. really interesting so, discussion. For for me, the interest is not, like, I don't subscribe to any UFO uh, magazines or, you know, <laughs> letters. Or, so, for me, the, the interest in this, um, besides some maybe potential eschatological uh, you know, curiosities. It's it's primarily missiological, evangelistic. You know, uh, increasingly people in our society, secular people, are being drawn to fringe stuff. You know, they they might not believe in God. They might not believe. Certainly, don't believe in Christ. Um, but UFOs, yeah, they, they're they're really open to that. You know, uh, and so if you can make a connection between what their interest is and what they profess to believe in. Uh, and point that back. Actually, there's there's a link. You know, th their eyes kind of pop open and say, "Oh wow, I didn't I didn't know the Bible talked about that. I didn't know there was room in a, a Christian worldview for my enthusiasm for aliens and UFOs and all this other thing." Um, you know, I thought you know you, one had to be either a Christian, just believe in God and angels and demons, uh, but the, you know the, there was no place in the biblical worldview for anything like uh, aliens or extraterrestrials or or anything like this. And and to show them that there's a, at least some overlap, um, I think creates a door and an interest. Like, well, what else does the Bible say? <laughs> yes. You know, and if you can go from these sort of you know demon human hybrids, the Nephilim, and actually point to the God Man, Christ Jesus, who's fully God and fully human. You know, whereas the Nephilim was just a, a perversion of that, uh, but the incarnation was the real thing. Um, the, the one who came down from heaven not to deceive us or do us harm, but to, you know, do us good. Um, you know, that's the goal right there. Yeah, I love it. Um, if anybody is listening to Joshua and wants to l listen to more about what he has to say, I've actually listened to his videos on YouTube. He has a channel called Sanity's Cove. Um, mm -hmm. There, I found several topics that I found of interest. You can go on there and find more information. Pastor Joshua, if somebody wants to connect or they want to hear more about you, do you have a podcast, a website, um, a channel? Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I used to keep up a web website, uh, but in, in the transition to back to America, I, I've kind of lost a, some of my uh, internet uh, presence. The, there is that YouTube channel, uh, Sanity's Cove, where I, I don't, pr I only have one video actually talking about UFOs. Everything else is about other things. So if people want to uh, subscribe to that or follow that or message me through that, they certainly uh, can do that. I also have an email address if you want to sh shoot me uh, personally. That's northernfires at gmail.com. Happy to engage. Uh, also, just want to mention some other sources if people want to go deeper into this. Um, like I realize what I've shared might just whet some people's curiosity and it's not a subject I, uh, deeply study or read upon, but there are other Christians who are actually going deep into this and who are really engaging the, it, you just want to maybe call it the paranormal community, you know, UFOs as well as, I mean, they get into all sorts of fringe things, Bigfoots, the whole, you know, uh, the, the whole nine yards. Um, I, I just got a few uh, um, sources that I sometimes touch on for, for references. You mind if I share those? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, there's two podcasts. The first, uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with, is the Blurry Creatures podcast. Blurry Creatures podcast. Again, this is a Christian from a Christian point of view, but delving into all sorts of fringe, uh, semi-paranormal sort of things. There's another one called The Haunted Cosmos. That's from a Christian point of view, and I think those guys particularly are from a kind of a more reformed 
uh, point of view, the Haunted Cosmos guys. There's a guy on uh, YouTube uh, called Tim Alberino, and and sometimes Tim Alberino actually reminds me a little bit of you, Eugene. He's sort of <laughs> not a, many of those. Sort of a very uh, adventurous, uh, missional guy who's done a, a, a lot of traveling. I think he's traveled a lot more down in like the Amazon, working with tribes and down in the jungle. Uh, but he has a YouTube where he talks about all sorts of wild stuff. Some of that from his own experience where he's dealt with like witch doctors and paranormal things with some of these Indian tribes uh, that he deals with. But he he touches on a lot of stuff. He's, he's kind of almost like an Indiana Jones sort of uh, uh, mi- missionary um, kind of guy. So that's Tim Alberino on YouTube. And lastly, and probably the most familiar, is uh, Michael Heisner. Um, you know, Michael Heisner, he has been t- touching on this stuff for decades, talking about, uh, you know, the the whole sons of God, you know, mentioned there in Job and in, uh, in the Psalms, or, you know, the sons of God, this this um, sort of heavenly court of uh, supernatural beings of which angels are just a part governing the universe. And, you know, that we live in a very full cosmos. You know, we look into space and see it as empty and dark, uh, but from God's perspective, it's actually full of activity uh, and a whole lot of uh, different creatures. And so he's touched on this and all sorts of, you know, kind of really the invisible world from a, a biblical point of view. He's sort of the theologian uh, that's been the forerunner uh, for so much of this. He's dead now. I think he died a year or two ago. Uh, but Michael Heisner, you can find him all over the place. He's got books, websites, you know, uh, answering questions that pertain to not just UFOs, but uh, all, all, all sorts of um, sort of supernatural things. Yeah, he was a real treasure. We've actually had him on this podcast a couple of times, okay. and uh, yeah. his his ministry no. has been um, in touch with us, uh, really wanting to get their materials out into the mission field. Uh, just a great guy and yeah. uh, amazing teaching, like you said, super foundational and uh, really revelational. He mm-hmm. he shared so much and enlightened me. Uh, and a lot of people on our podcast, just as uh, as you have done. Hey, brother, it's been such a blessing to have you back on here. Good to hear your voice again, and uh, thanks yeah. for joining us. I really appreciate well, thanks it. Thanks for having me on. Love All right. being here. All right. God bless you. Have a good one. And you. Bye. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for another Back to Jerusalem podcast. Again, I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of America. God bless. 